we got to get rid of some things to put the right things in, but God never leaves our lives void. He takes away something to put it new and right in our lives. The game is never won in the locker room. The game is never won because the coach made a great speech. The game is won because we're inspired to get out on the field or the court and to play. Continuing our study through Ephesians, we're beginning to read in verse 17. Today I want to talk to you about a changed life. What Paul says is this, that whenever you become a believer, whenever you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your life is changed. It is changed, and you should live a changed life. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, probably many of you know that verse of Scripture, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and what new things have come. That's a summary of what he's saying here in Ephesians chapter 4. Basically this, that when we're in Christ, we're supposed to be new. A new creation, not a retread, something brand new. And therefore, our lives are changed. In this, he shows us what our lives were like and what people's lives are apart from Christ and then what our lives should be like. Look what it says in verse 17, Ephesians 4. This I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they, having become calloused, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, that which is being corrupted in accordance with lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now, you need to leave your Bibles open because we're going to go through this verse by verse to show you what Paul says about this changed life. The first thing he says is, I want you to know this, that you are no longer to walk just as the Gentiles walk. Now, do you know who who he was talking to? He was talking to a bunch of Gentiles. And, And he said this, I don't want you to walk like Gentiles walk, even though you are a Gentile. But I want you to know you're supposed to walk differently. Let me say it to us in our day and time. I don't want you to walk just like an American. I don't want you to live just like a citizen of the United States. I don't want you to walk just like the things and the people of this world, even though you are an American, even though you are a citizen of the United States, even though that's true, I don't want you to walk like they walk because you are supposed to be different. You're supposed to be different. Something happened in your life. I don't know when it happened to you, but hopefully it's happened in your life. And that is the day you asked Jesus to come into your heart and your life and you were born again. And when you were born again, you became a citizen not only of this country but of heaven. And now that has superiority and primacy in your life. It's the thing that's most important above everything else is that you're a child of God, a citizen of heaven. And so you're supposed to walk like that Christian. Walk different than just that person who has citizenship in this world now 
He's not being condemning when he's about to say who they are and what they are because this is where we all were. But he describes what life in this world and life as a Gentile or life as an American is apart from Christ. That's what he says there, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and affirm together with you that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. And here's what he says, in the futility of their mind. That's number one. How does a Gentile walk? In the futility of their mind. Number two, being darkened in their understanding. And three, excluded from the life of God. That's exactly where a person is apart from Christ. Now, Paul's not being condemning, and I'm certainly not being condemning. That's where every one of us were. It says, first, the thing, when you're apart from Christ and you're just a Gentile out there living without Christ, it says you walk in the futility of your mind. You know what that means? You walk the best you can with your mind, with what you think is right, with what you think is good, with what you think is profitable. You try hard, you work hard, you do the best you can, but the problem is that our minds do not have the capacity or capability of walking like God ordained for us to walk and God wants us to walk. Our minds are darkened, it says. Isn't that what it says? Our minds are darkened in our understanding. In other words, we don't see things like they really are. We see things through the, through the shadow of sin. We see through the shadow of selfishness and pride. Whenever we are left to our own minds without Christ in our heart, we're out there for ourselves we're trying to live for ourselves, do all we can, get all we can, can what we have, and sit on the can, aren't we? That's what we're all trying to do. We're trying to watch out for ourselves. We're trying to do the best we can. We're trying to succeed in our job. We're trying to make the money. We're trying to have the house. We're trying to get that car. We're trying to achieve, and we're trying to do all of these things, trying to raise our kids, or our grandkids, trying to do all those things in some kind of measurement of what is success and we don't have any idea because we don't understand success from God's perspective. Because we can't see it. We don't understand it. I don't know about you, but I now that I'm saved and I look at people who are unsaved, some of those my family, some of those friends of mine who are unsaved, and I watch them in the futility of their mind. They're, they're good people. They're good, but they're trying to achieve and, and they're setting goals that are not nearly as important as the eternal goals because see this life will be no more and all those things that that were goals that they achieve will be laid aside and the only thing that really matters is who are you with God and where are you headed after this life is over and if you spend your whole life working for the temporal things if you achieve every temporal thing you don't have anything when it comes to when it really matters and that's eternity but see without God in our life the futility of our mind darkened in our understanding of what is important and, uh, and it says separated from the life of God separated from the life of God in other words did you know when I came to understand what life was really all about when God came in my life when did you come to understand what life and eternal life is all about? When God comes in your life. It's something that it just opens up your mind. It opens up your heart to see things you've never seen before. It changes your priorities in your life. Why is that? Because the life of God, the eternal life of God comes inside of you. Now, that's where the Gentiles and that's where these people were. And he says, you don't need to be walking there anymore. But here's the question. Why do people walk there? Why does, a, why does one walk like the Gentile instead of like God wants them to walk? Here, here's what it says. This is what it says in verse 18. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God, number one, because of ignorance that is in them. Because of ignorance. Do you know why some people walk the way of the world instead of the way of God? Do you know why some people aren't believers? Because they're ignorant. Now, I know ignorance sounds like a bad word. Ignorance is really not a bad word. Ignorance means you just don't know. You just don't know. You just don't under, understand. You don't know that. To say somebody's dumb is bad because that means they don't have the capacity to know. 
But to say somebody's ignorant is not a condemning word. It just simply means they don't know. And many people walk out here in the world, and you work with them, and you live by them, and they're in your family. Many people can walk in this world as a Gentile rather than as a believer. They can walk in the futility of their mind simply because they're ignorant, and they don't know there's something else. They don't know there's life in God. They don't know there's eternal life. You know why? Because nobody taught them. Nobody tells them. Nobody teaches them. Now, I know that we're in the Bible Belt of the South. We're in Alabama. And people in Alabama, you know what they think? Everybody knows in Alabama. Everybody in Alabama knows about being a Christian. Everybody in Alabama knows. There's nobody ignorant in Alabama about spiritual things, about the church. We got churches on every corner. You can listen to it on the radio. You can go on the Internet. You can watch television. No one is ignorant of spiritual things. Oh, yes, they are. I will guarantee you this. Within a half a mile of this church, and that's really stretchy, within a half a mile of this church, you could go knock on some doors, and there are people who do not know about Jesus. They do not know that Jesus died on a cross, paid the price for their sin. They do not know that. Because, see, those people aren't watching Christian television. Those people aren't listening to Christian radio. You understand that? Those people are not coming into the doors of our church. They're not here. They're out there. And the way that they know is because somebody tells them. And do you know how it usually happens when somebody tells? It's not because the preacher preaches a, to a massive group of people and people get saved. That's not how people get saved. Do you know how people get saved? Do you know how they understand that, they, that they're lost and they need God and that God has a life for them? It's usually on a one-to-one basis. Because on a one-to-one basis, they can't lose their concentration. On a one-to-one basis, they understand what's being said to them and they hear what's being said And people, by the majorities, are saved because somebody told them. And our responsibility is to go tell somebody so that they're not ignorant. And there's some people who are lost and they're Gentiles who are out there who need God in their life and they're that way because they were ignorant. And I was ignorant until somebody told me. And you were. But there's some others who are Gentiles for another reason. Look what it says. Not only because of ignorance, but in end of verse 18, because of the hardness of their heart. Some are Gentiles, some are apart from God because of the hardness of their heart. Yes, there can be people with hard hearts. Do you know how their hearts got hardened? Here it is. Look at verse 19. It tells you. And they, having become calloused, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Do you know how they became hard? They became calloused. Have any of you ever had a callous on your hands? Some of you ladies have never had a callous on your hands. I can look at Never had that? Some of you guys never had a callous on your hands. Have you ever had a callous on your hand? Uh, You know, a callous forms and it just immediately becomes a callus isn't that way it works oh no that's not the way it works if you ever had a callus i was trying to catch you in that see if you ever had a callus you know it doesn't just become a callus you know what happens the first thing is you pick up that hoe or that rake or that shovel or whatever and you begin to work and it begins to rub and it becomes a blister there are the people with calluses i saw that they become a blister and that blister hurts And for long, that blister will, if you keep going, that blister will burst. But if you'll keep going on, eventually, where that blister was, there are calluses in that place. I have calluses on my hand. I will show you. Come right here. Okay, that's, I cattle farm, and that's from calluses. You know, I don't have real soft hands. How'd that callus get there? Because it was rubbed and rubbed and rubbed and finally got hard. You know the thing about a callus? It doesn't have any feeling. Not really. It doesn't have any feeling. It becomes hard. becomes insensitive. Do you know why people become hard and insensitive? Listen to me. You may be there. It's because they were in the presence of God. 
They were under the Word of God. They were influenced by the Spirit of God. And God was speaking to their heart. God was communicating to their spirit that they needed to respond. And as God spoke to them, they knew they needed to respond. They knew that they needed to say yes. They knew they needed to do that. But they held on. And they kept from doing it. And they walked out. They said no. That was hard to say no, but they said no. The next time when they felt that, it was easier to say no. The next time when they felt that, it was easier to say no. And if you stay in that state, you can finally get to a point where you don't even feel it. Because your heart gets hardened, your heart gets calloused, and you don't respond. So there's some people who are ignorant. We need to tell them. There's some people who are hard. Now, I'm here to tell you, God still can touch a hardened heart. I mean, you know, somebody said, well, I tell you what's a hard nut to crack. Well, God's got some big hammers, I can tell you. He's got big hammers. He's used some of them on me. We were talking in a group the other day. We were talking about, you know, how God does a work in our life. I don't know about you. You know, some people, when God takes out a hammer, he takes that little jewelry hammer, you know, and he, that little tap, tap. Whatever God's working in my life, he pulls up the compressor. It's called a jackhammer. You know, that's, and God has whatever it takes to do it. But that's why Gentiles stay there. Instead of the things of God, they're ignorant or they've gotten hardened. And so what happens in their life? It tells you right there. It says, and so what happens? They have a life that's full of sensuality. Sensuality, that doesn't mean just immorality. Sensuality means that you live by your senses. What feels good, do it. What tastes good, eat it. Just let your senses rule your life. Whatever your senses say, just rule your life instead of being in charge and being in control. I'm here to tell you, you let your senses rule your life, you're going to be in trouble. Okay, you're going to be in trouble. Notice what else it says. They have a rule, their life is ruled by sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Did y'all see that? Do you see that in your Bible? Did y'all notice that? This means yes. Does your Bible have that? Impurity with greediness. Isn't that something? Why would God put that? Because most of us don't even think greediness is sin. He's describing what a Gentile is like. He said, you know what Gentiles are like? They're greedy. And therefore, if we are not Gentiles and we are children of God, we should not be greedy, but we should be givers and blessers of others and not focused on me. Think about that. Whenever you start thinking about yourself, do you ever have greediness in your life? Do you ever have greediness in your life? And, and listen to me, greediness is not only just material possessions. Well, I'm not greedy about my money. No, what about greediness of time? What about greediness of attention? You want your portion plus some? We better move on, haven't we? That could be convicting for long. That's where the Gentiles live. Look what he says. This is important. This is where we are. Listen very quickly. But you did not learn Christ in this way. When Christ came in your life, he changed you. You're supposed to be changed. How did you come to know Christ? Here's how you come to know Christ. If you don't know Christ today, this is how you come to know Christ. Verse 21. If indeed you have heard him. Now that's very important to notice what that says. Look at that in your Bible. Does that say that you've heard of him? Did it say heard of him? No, it says that you have what? Heard him. Do you know how you get saved? Do you know how you came to relationship with God? Here's how it happened. God spoke to you. He spoke to you. Matter of fact, it says that the only way that you can become a child of God is that Father calls your name. The Father speaks to you. Whenever I take children, we have children who get saved, and I have a chance to counsel them. The first thing I ask those children, I say, let me ask you something. Have you heard God speak to you? Have you heard God speak? Oh, we don't hear Him with our ears. We hear Him with our heart. But we know, that little child will know, yes, I have. Yes, sir, I have. I've heard God speak to me. 
I know that God has spoken to me. Do you know how you got saved? God spoke to you. He called you by name. He knows you personally. And he'll speak to your heart. That's how you get saved. But that's not all. Look what, what else happens. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him. You know what he, he does then? You know what happens? Once you hear him, he teaches you. Now, those are not fun lessons that he has to teach you. First of all, he teaches about who you are. That's not fun to find out who you are. Have you discovered who you are apart from Christ? He'll teach us who we are. And then he teaches us who he is. And then he'll teach us how we can move from where we are to where he is. That's pretty good. All right? He lets us know where we are. He lets us know where he is. And there's a chasm between it. How do we bridge that chasm? How do we bridge that chasm to get from where we are in sin to where he is in righteousness? How do we get from being death to life? How does that happen in our life? He teaches us that. What is that he teaches us? That's what it says. Just, verse 21, just as truth is in Jesus. Do you know how he teaches us to bridge that chasm? He teaches that the only way to get from where we are to where he is, is in Jesus. That's the truth. Jesus is the one who made the way. Jesus, on his death on the cross, provided the way. And that's how we get from being lost to saved. That's how we get from being Gentile to a child of God. That's how we move from a destiny that is destruction to a destiny of eternal life that's how we get it the truth is Jesus so he speaks to me he lets me know that he's real he tells me who I am he tells me who he is and he reveals to me that the way the truth and the life is Jesus and it's only through Jesus that we make our way that's how you came to know Christ that's what he said in verse 20 but you did not learn Christ in this way, but you learned him how? You didn't learn him through your own mind. You didn't learn him through the Gentiles' way. You didn't learn him through sensuality. You learned him because Jesus spoke to you. God spoke to you. He taught you. And he revealed Jesus as the truth to you. Now, because of that, what happens? This is that changed life. That in reference to your former manner of life, that Gentile life, you would lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with that lust of deceit. In other words, when I come to know Christ, I'm going to lay aside the old man, the old self, the old way. I don't name the name of Christ and, and continue to walk the way I used to walk. When I name the name of Christ and He's changed my life, I'm different. I am different. I'm not like other people. I'm not like those people. I'm not like who I used to be. I've laid aside the old self. Look at verse 23. And that you, being renewed in the spirit of your mind, here it is, verse 24, and have put on the new self. You take off the old self and you put on the new self. In regard to... If you take the imagery of clothing, which is what he's saying, you take off the old, dirty clothes and you put on the new clothes. You take off the old things, you put on the new things. That's what happened to you when you got saved. Remember what it said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and new things have come. And when you got saved, that happened to you. You're a new person. But that means we ought to live like a new person. Amen? We ought to be different. So look what it says in verse number 24. And putting on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. This is what it means to put on the new self. You began to live righteously. That means to be right. To do the right things. To do what God wants you to do. And holiness Holiness, that, that is totally what God does in your life. God is holy, and the only way you for, for you to be holy is for God to make you holy. And what it simply means is you begin to walk in the likeness of God. Now, it's very important to know this. 
notice in your Bible, it does not say that you are God. Does it say that you are God? No. There are some faiths that teach that you actually become a God. We do not become a God. There's always a distinction between us and holy God. He is God and I am not. I do not become God, but I live in the likeness of God. In other words, what God does and what God considers important and what God teaches us as truth, that's what begins to happen. And I began to live that in my life. And that's a dramatic change. That's a dramatic change from me living in the futility of my mind, me being darkened to the things of God. There's a dramatic change in my life. Next week, we'll get to the application. You can go ahead and read it. From here to the end of that chapter, he simply says, let me give you a few illustrations of what I mean. Whenever you were doing this, you're to stop doing that and do this. All right? And whenever you find yourself wanting to do that, stop doing that and do this. It's in there. Everything he says, these things are, were in your life. They don't need to be there anymore. Something else needs to be in your life. Now, I want you to read that so you can get ready for next Sunday, okay? But here's something that's very important to know about things of God. God does not empty out your life to leave it empty. God empties out your life to fill it with something else. Everybody says, well, you Christians are again everything. No, we're not. We're for everything. You just got again something to get for something. Did y'all get that? We got to get rid of some things to put the right things in. But God never leaves our lives void. He takes away something to put it new and right in our lives. You don't walk out of here empty. You could walk out of here different. You're not just trying to not do the wrong thing. You're going to be busy doing the right thing. And whenever that wrong thing creeps up, and there's a temptation to fall in that wrong thing. You don't do the wrong thing. You just decide, I'm going to do the right thing. That's what it means to be changed. Let me tell you something. The greatest impact that our church will make, the greatest impact we have on this community is not when we gather here. We're gathering here for a pep rally. Do you understand that? We're here having a pep rally, and we're here getting charged up and fired up, so we go out there and we make a difference. The game is never won in the locker room. The game is never won because the coach made a great speech. The game is won because we're inspired to get out on the field or the court and to play. And the greatest impact our church makes is when we as Christians, not Gentiles, not just Americans, we are changed, our life is different, and we live out there among the people of the world, and we do not condemn them, but we love them. And we do not point at their failures, but we reveal to them a change that has happened in our life. And if we will live a changed life around people, you'll be surprised. Somebody might ask you, how did that happen in your life? What is there that you've got that I don't have? And that's the easiest way to witness in the world is when they're asking you about what happened in your life. And you know why they ask you? Because they see you different. You are changed. Your life is different. Not because you worked harder, but because Jesus changed you. Jesus changed you. A changed life. God's called us to live it. And that's where we make the impact in our world. It's not necessarily in how you dress. It's not in what you can achieve. For even trophies will one day rest. How do we handle crisis when hope is hard to find, when forgiveness seems pointless, when ends don't meet and life is on the brink of change. Loving God, loving you. Parker Memorial Baptist Church.